To drill your holes correctly, you really need to have a pretty good idea of where your cable will be running. We plan that ahead of time, and we'll explain each run as we put it in. Non-metallic sheathed cable is a do-it-yourselfer's dream come true. It makes wiring a lot more simple than running lots of individual conductors through conduit. It comes in different sizes depending on the capacity you want for the circuit and with two or three conductors plus a ground. The first circuit we're going to wire is the one that includes the overhead light and the switch. Now this is a single 15 amp circuit, so we'll use 14 gauge wire with two conductors. For quick reference, it's known as 14-2 cable, and for the first run, we pull off enough cable for the entire distance, allowing plenty of extra for the connections at both ends. This one will go from the service panel to a switch box for the light. To get things started, we run one end of the cable down through the top plate, along the stud, past the front of the panel. Code requires that the cable be secured to the framing every four and a half feet. These are special staples that hold the cable in place without damaging the conductors inside. Here we need two, one near the top plate and one near the panel. Next, we thread the cable through the holes in the ceiling joist, which gets us over the doorway. By the way, where the cable is supported by holes in the joist of the studs, no staples are necessary. Once past the door, we run the cable through the top plate down to the switch box, and we staple it as needed along the side of the stud. According to code, the last staple before the cable hits a box should be no more than 12 inches from the box to keep the cable properly confined. The cable we've just run will bring power from the service panel over to the switch. The next cable will bring power from the switch over to the light. It goes along the same stud as the first cable and gets stapled into place. It's possible to staple one cable directly on top of another. It's also possible to leave all the cables loose and staple them all into place at the same time once the wiring's done. The overhead light is one joist over from where the cable comes up, so I have to run it through one more hole. I make the bend and run it along the side of the joist out to the fixture box. This is another situation where the cable needs to be supported at least every four and a half feet. Lights. Recessed lights like this generally hang between two ceiling joists suspended from a metal bar nailed or screwed into the bottom of the joist. They don't require a separate electrical box because they come with an attached metallic box where you make the electrical connections. And that should give you an idea of how to rough in electrical components when the framing's still open. If you don't have access to open framing, you can put in what's known as a retrofit or remodeler's box and pull new cable through an existing wall. The first step is tracing the outline of the box on the wall so you can cut a properly shaped and sized hole. Just make sure you're going between the studs, not directly over one. You can use a keyhole saw to cut a hole like this in drywall, but to go through plaster and lath, you'll probably need to drill pilot holes and use a power saw like a jigsaw or reciprocating saw. In this project, there was an unfinished basement below so we could drill up through the subfloor and bottom plate directly under the new box location. That's where the new cable will enter the wall cavity above. The next step is using a fish tape to bring the new cable up. It's actually a thin, flexible strip of steel that you fish into the new opening till it hits the bottom of the wall cavity and then use like a probe to find the hole you drilled. You can't see where it's going so it might take some trial and error before it finally pokes through. Once the end comes through, attach one end of the new cable to it. The other end goes back to the power source. Make sure it's fastened securely so it doesn't come loose inside the wall. Then from above, start rewinding the fish tape to pull the cable up. Take your time so it doesn't get hung up along the way. Once the cable's cleared the hole in the wall, you can detach it from the fish tape and run it through the back of your remodeler's box. To finish the rough-in job, you secure the box in the opening. The easiest one for do-it-yourselfers has flanges that catch the back side of the wall when you insert the box and then lock it in place as you tighten the screw at the back of the box. That's one way to retrofit electrical boxes. Let's go back to the demonstration project to talk some more about working with new cable. 
Now we want to cut the wires to their final length. Code requires that each wire extends six inches from the front of the box. This is called six inches of free conductor. I hold the cable next to the box and cut it to the right length. You'll find that these lineman's pliers are a useful tool in wiring. Next I strip off the outer plastic sheathing. This little tool has a tiny tooth on the inside. I slide it up over the cable, squeeze it gently, and pull it down past the end of the cable. This splits open the sheathing. Now I peel it back and cut it off. To get the wires into the box, we have to break through small plastic holes on the top called knockout tabs. You punch through the tab with a screwdriver or handle of the pliers. Now I push the wires into the box. This box also has a metal cable clamp that will hold the wires in place. I fish the conductors past these. Before attaching any devices, you want to expose about an inch of bare wire on the hot and neutral leads with a wire stripper. It has notches corresponding to the various wire sizes, so you set the wire in the right notch, squeeze down to cut the insulation, and hold tight while pulling the insulation off the end. That's a basic technique, but in new construction, you generally leave that step till the final trim out stage.